YouTube, just know that it's going to be the link uh, in the description below. So you can go ahead and print it out, uh, follow along, do whatever you want with it. But we're just going to practice. OK, so the AP exam is in May. It's not for another month, but it's always good to start practicing uh, as early as we can. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and start scrolling down to the very first question. And I believe there's 28 questions on here um, for this particular section. And if it's too small, let me know. Otherwise, I can sort of like zoom in. I think maybe that could possibly be a little better. OK, cool. So the very first question, I already see that it's going to be a limit problem. And typically, uh, you don't necessarily oh, the zoom is not very good. There you go. So typically, you don't necessarily have to uh, plug in or use direct substitution to check that it's going to be 0 over 0 or indeterminate. But in this case, just to show you that it's going to be indeterminate, if I plug in the 2, because it's as the limit approaches 2, it's going to be 4 plus 2 minus 6 over, and then when you plug in the 2 on the bottom, it's going to be 4 minus 4. Whoops. And so you're going to see that this is 6 minus 6 over 0, 0 over 0, so it's indeterminate. So you can go ahead and solve this two different ways. Remember, it's a multiple choice test, so you can technically use L'Hopital's rule, where you take the derivative of the top, take the derivative of the bottom separately. But in this case, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to pretend like we totally forgot about that. So let's go ahead and use factoring. So we're going to factor out the top and make it x uh, plus 3x minus 2. And then on the bottom, it's going to be an x minus 2, x plus 2. And the reason why we're doing that is because the x minus 2s are going to cancel out in this case. That's technically the whole. And so now we have limit as x approaches 2 of x plus 3 over x plus 2. And now using direct substitution, we'll get 2 plus 3 over 2 plus 2. So 5 fourths. And the answer here is going to be d. OK, again, if you want to use uh, L'Hopital's rule, you are more than welcome to. There is absolutely nothing wrong with that. This is a multiple choice test. So no one's really going to know exactly what you're doing here. OK, so for number two, we have the particular function here, and they just want us to find f prime of 2. So that's just the derivative evaluated at 2. So let's go ahead and take the derivative here. It's going to be 3x squared minus 2x plus 1. Gosh, if you don't remember the power rule at this point, and if you're taking the AP exam, good luck. But anyway, we just use the power rule, and now we just go ahead and plug in 2 into our function. So f prime of 2 is 3 times 2 squared minus 2 times 2 plus 1. You can totally do this in your head, but I'm just trying to show uh, the process. OK, so we have 3 times 9 minus uh, 4 plus 1, 27, and then minus 3. Wait, did I not do my math wrong? Or did I not do my math right here? Holy hell. Wait. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know why I thought that 3 squared was equal to 9. So if this happens during the test, you're going to see, OK, uh, <laughs> Um, you suck at math, kind of like I do here. So this is 3 times 4 minus 4 plus 1. 12 minus 3, so the answer is 9. Hopefully you get the same answer. Someone got D? I don't think it's D. I believe it's going to be B. Yes, and I even checked the answer key, so the answer is going to be B. So watch your math here, okay? It sucks because if you do get an answer of 5, you're going to think, okay, that's the correct answer and you're good to go, but there's a possibility that that's not the correct answer. OK, once again, uh, I post the replays on my YouTube and you guys are able to download this particular test on my the link in my bio. And if you're watching this on YouTube, then just know that it's going to be in the link in the description. All right. So here we go. We have an integral here. And they want us to find which integral is equivalent to this one. So what they want you to do is really go ahead and apply the u substitution. Because you have an x here and you have an x squared, really, that's the value that you have uh, for your u. So we're going to make u equal to x squared, du is equal to 2x dx. If I bring the 2x to the other side, I get du over 2x is equal to dx. And this is what they're really testing you, in my opinion. They want you to make sure that you change the limits when we start rewriting this in terms of u. So because now our integral is going to be in terms of u, we have to rewrite the 0 and the 4 in terms of that variable u, because we're going to be in the u universe. So one thing that you just have to keep in mind that in this particular, uh, the lower parameter is 0. So when x is equal to 0, you plug it into this equation. That will be u is equal to 0 squared, or just 0. And we're going to do the same thing for the 4. When x is equal to 4, then u is equal to the 4 squared, which is just going to be 16. And so now we can go ahead and write our correct parameters. We have 0 to 16. 
And then now we have x e to the u times our dx now becomes du over 2x. And of course, the x's cancel out. That's the whole reason why we wanted to do u substitution. So we have 1 half from 0 to 16, e to the u, du. And there you go. So 1 half, 0 to 16. And if you look at these options, honestly, when you find your parameters, 0 to 16, you already knew that that was going to be uh, the answer B. Jason, that's awesome, dude. Yeah, so every week I'm going to do, I believe, so I'm, this week I'm going to do AB. Next week I'm going to do BC. And it's all going to be the same test. So the first one's going to be a multiple choice, no calculator allowed. My next live is going to be the multiple choice with calculator. And then on Friday, I'm going to film a, a free, the FRQs, the six questions on there that I'll have on my YouTube channel. So you can watch the lives here or you can catch the replays on my YouTube channel. All right, let's go to number four. Write the equation. Whoops, let me zoom out. Jeez, let me zoom out even more. Okay, hopefully. All right. Which of the following is the equation of the line tangent to the graph of this particular function at 1, comma, negative 3? Well, if you already know uh, the, the equation of the tangent line, Tyler, BC will be next week. I'm going to try to fit it in earlier than that, but it's all going to be next week. So uh, I'm going to continue posting reels, or in this case, I'm going to keep continue posting TikToks on my uh, my page. So I'm, this entire month is just going to be strictly for AP Calc. So let's be ready. All right. So if we want to find the equation of the tangent line, we already know our y1 and our x1. That's this particular point, 1 comma negative 3. The hard part is that we have to find our, um, our slope. So if I were to plug this in, y minus negative 3 is equal to m times x minus 1. We have y plus 3 is equal to m times x minus 1. I'm just going to look at this and see, perhaps I can eliminate what, some of my answers. And shoot, it looks like I can't do that at all. So we have to just go ahead and take the derivative of this particular function. x squared minus 3xy is equal to 10. So when we take the derivative of x squared, that's 2x minus, now let's be careful here. We have to use product rule, but remember, whenever you take the derivative of y, we have to include a dy dx because that's implicit differentiation. So we have negative 3 times y plus negative 3x and then times the derivative of y, which is 1, and then dy dx. Okay, I'm trying to be as detailed as possible because there could be someone out there that just doesn't know exactly uh, what we're doing here, but hopefully this makes sense. Okay, so now if I simplify this, 2x minus 3y, this term here, it becomes negative 3x times 1 minus 3x dy dx is equal to 0. And so now I'm trying to find the, the dy dx, which is a slope. And so at this point, I'm just going to go ahead and plug in our coordinate. When x is equal to 1, y is equal to negative 3. So let's go ahead and plug that in. 2 times 1 minus 3 times negative 3 minus 3 times 1 dy dx is equal to 0. So we have 2 plus 9 minus 3 dy dx is equal to 0. And now let's go ahead and add this together, which is 11, and bring it to the other side. So negative 3 dy over dx is equal to uh, negative 11. And then divide the negative 3 to the other side. So dy dx is equal to 11 over 3. Nice. That's our slope at that particular point. So if we were to plug in it to this equation, because we sort of already had it set up, now we have y plus 3 is equal to 11 over 3x minus 1. And it looks like our answer is E. Yes, absolutely. It should be easy. Honestly, the AP, if you guys continue practicing, if you're taking calculus AB for the first time, if you are taking the exam, keep in mind that this is fairly easy if you continue doing problems. You're going to recognize the types of problems that are given to you on the AP exam, and they're so fucking easy. You just have to continue seeing the same thing. And you're going to notice, man, it's the same pattern. Okay? All right, so for number five. We have this particular function for g of x, and they want us to find on which of the intervals is the function decreasing. Sorry if you can't see. It's a little blurry. Okay, where is it decreasing? In other words, when is the derivative less than 0? Well, the first thing we got to do is just take the derivative. Okay, got to practice your fractions here. 1 third times 3. This is going to just be x squared minus 3x minus 70. Okay. And so now we have to go ahead and factor this out because first we want to find out when it's equal to zero. Okay, if I were to factor this out using some quadratics, I get x minus 10 times x plus 7, it looks like. 
And so x is equal to 10 and minus 7. Now, I'm going to draw a number line. That's how I'm used to finding out where it's, uh, how I'm going to check whether it's increasing or decreasing. I have negative 7 and I have 10. And now we just plug in some values to the left. So let's plug in negative 8. I'm going to plug in 0 in between negative 7 and 10. And then now I'm going to go ahead and plug in 11. Okay, when I plug this in, I like to plug it into the factor form because I don't even need to solve it. We just want to know whether it's positive or negative. When you plug in negative 8 in here, you get negative 8 minus 10, that's negative 18, times negative 8 plus 7, whoops, that's a negative 1. Negative times a negative is a positive. I don't even care what the answer is, I just know it's positive. So the derivative is positive here, the function is increasing. If I plug in 0, if I plug it into this factor form, 0 minus 10 is negative 10 times 0 plus 7, that's 7. That's going to be a negative number. And then the last one, if I plug in 10, or if I plug in 11, I'm sorry, 10, uh, 11 minus 10 is 1, 11 plus 7 is 17, or 18. Doesn't even matter, to be honest, because it's still positive. So they were asking, when is it decreasing? It's decreasing from these intervals, negative 7 to 10. So then our answer is going to be E. And guys, if you see any mistakes, let me know in the comments. You know, this is what happens. And a lot of the times they like to trick you. They like to think that you got the answer correct, but sometimes you're going to get it wrong. All right, here we go. So now we have this particular integral. Let me write it a little bigger. 2 to 4 dx of 5 minus 3x dx. Oops, the dx is already there. Okay, let's go ahead and use u substitution. u is equal to 5 minus 3x. So our du is going to just be equal to negative 3x dx. And if I bring, or negative 3 dx, I'm sorry. If I bring the negative 3 to the other side, I get du over negative 3 is equal to dx. And so now I'm going to plug this in. I now have du over negative 3. That's what our dx was over u. And now let's change our parameters, kind of like we did in, uh, I forgot what problem. I believe it was like number 2. Okay, so when the lower parameter was equal to 2, that means that when x is equal to 2, then u is equal to, use this formula here, 5 minus 3 times 2. So 5 minus 6, negative 1. So we have negative 1. Okay, when x is equal to 4, then u is equal to 5 minus 3 times 4. 5 minus 12 is equal to negative 7. So now we have a negative 7 on here. Cool. All right, so if I rewrite this real quick, this becomes I can put a negative 1 third on the outside because this negative 1 third wasn't on my denominator. And I have integral from negative 1 to negative 7 of du over u. Awesome. Now, when we go ahead and take the integral, we have negative 1 third. Natural log of absolute value of u, don't forget your absolute value from negative 1 to negative 7. Because if you plug in, if you don't use your absolute value, you're going to get an undefined uh, or a function that just doesn't exist. All right. So we have negative 1 third. When I plug in the negative 7, that's natural log of 7 minus natural log of 1. And guess what? Natural log of 1 is just 0, so that goes away. So my answer is just going to be negative 1 third natural log of 7. And if we look at our answer, it looks like that's going to be B. Awesome. All right, let's continue. Number 7. Okay, let f be a function of this particular uh, value. What is the instantaneous rate of change? Instantaneous rate of change is just another fancy way of saying, what the hell is the derivative at 3? So we take the derivative, 3x squared minus 12x plus 8, and now we plug in 3. So we have 3 times 3 squared minus 12 times 3 plus 8. Okay, 3 times 9, because that's a 3 squared, that's 27, minus 36 plus 8. Okay, 27 minus 36, I believe that's 11. Wait, 27 minus 36, I, I, it's like I can't add negative 9 plus 8, so then my answer is negative 1. There you go, so my answer is C. A lot of the times it's just like, can you do some basic math? All right, beautiful. Let's go to number eight. All right, lengthy, lengthy, lengthy. Let's read it real quick. A particle moves along a straight line. The graph of the particle's velocity is given uh, on the graph here. So this is going to be the velocity function. Keep that in mind. This is the derivative function. Okay? Sean, thank you. If that was wrong, make sure you point it out. Uh, did I not take my derivative correctly? Let's just double check real quick. X cubed when I took... Ah, we'll talk about it later. But Sean, thank you.
Okay, we'll talk about it later. I shouldn't be looking at the comments, but Sean, thank you. All right, so here we go. Let's just talk about uh, the velocity here, okay? So the velocity is going to be this function here, so keep that in mind, okay? And they, they tell you all these different things. I'm not even going to read the whole thing, but they're saying, for what values of t is the speed of the particle decreasing? Now, listen very carefully. If the speed is decreasing, then that means the velocity and the acceleration have to be different signs. So different signs. In other words, if the velocity is positive, then the acceleration has to be uh, negative. And it, the other way around, if the velocity is negative, then the acceleration has to be positive. So this is where we have to be really careful, okay? So if you look at this graph, again, this is the graph of the velocity function. So up here, or this entire, or I'm just gonna uh, take it in sections here, the velocity is positive, okay? So velocity is positive, and the acceleration, meaning the derivative of the velocity, is positive because the function is increasing. Okay, so now we have a positive positive. That means that the particle here is increasing, or the speed of the particle is increasing. And now let's go ahead and do this section. Okay, here the velocity is still positive, but the acceleration, the slope, or the derivative of the velocity here is negative. So the acceleration is negative. Wow, two different signs. So we know between this interval, the speed of the particle is um, the speed of the particle is going to be decreasing. So right now we have j and k as one of our options. The only one that looks like it's going to be possible, it looks like maybe c. But I'm, let's just continue to double check. Now when we go to the next section, here the velocity is negative. And the acceleration is also negative because the function is decreasing. So in this case, the speed is increasing. And last section over here, the velocity is negative still. And the acceleration, the function is increasing here. So we have an acceleration that's positive. Therefore, the particle's speed is increasing. So this is another interval where the particle is increasing. So we have J and K and then L and M. So our answer is going to be C. All right, let's go to number nine. Oops. So we have this particular function. They want to know where is the function uh, for which of the values of x is f not continuous. Okay, not continuous means the function does not exist at that specific point. So if you look at the bottom here, the function definitely does not exist when x plus 1 is equal to 0. Let me write that a little better. x plus 1 is equal to 0. That means that when x is equal to negative 1, the function is not continuous. So, so far we have options A, B, C, and D, okay? And then, technically we can already say that we can set X minus 2 is equal to 0. So basically when 2, is, uh, X is equal to 0, that's uh, where the function is not continuous. And then keep in mind this is basically uh, a whole because we have an X minus 2 on the top and then we have an X minus 2 on the bottom. So this, is, this function would just become X minus 2, X plus 3 over X plus 1. But we still have a whole. So therefore, the function's not going to be continuous at that specific point. Okay, so our answer here is going to be D. Let's go to number 10. So we have a particle along the x-axis. We have this particular velocity. If the particle of the position is, is negative 2 at t is equal to 0, what is the position when t is equal to 3? This is really important. This is what we call a net change, okay? So they give us the velocity. That means that if we were to take the integral from 0 to 3 of the velocity function, then using the first fundamental theorem of calculus, this is the position at 3 minus the position at 0. This is very important. This comes up uh, at least once on the multiple choice and then once during the, the free response. So when t is equal to 0, we already know that the position is negative 2. So we can give this value negative 2. So we have x of 3 minus negative 2. And so all we have to do now is just find what this integral is equal to. And that's the integral of 3t squared minus 4 dt. So let's just quickly do that. Okay, so if we use power rule, this is t cubed minus 4t from 0 to 3. And then this is equal to x of 3. And then now because we had a negative negative here, I'm just going to make that a plus 2. Let's go ahead and plug in our, use the first fundamental theorem of calculus. We plug in our 3. So 27 minus 12 minus, and then when you plug in zero, this entire thing just becomes zero. 
Okay, so here we go. 27 minus 12, that's 15, is equal to x of 3 plus 2. Okay, let's go ahead and bring the 2 to the other side. 13 is equal to x of 3. So our answer is A. Okay, net change. Super important. I want you to think about this specific problem because I guarantee that it's definitely going to be on a multiple choice and even perhaps on the multi um, free response questions. Okay, at least one question. Oh, this is amazing. Okay, so they give us the function, um, the function f, which is defined by this integral. And as you can see, it's in terms of t and it's from 0 to x, I'm already thinking they're probably going to ask us to, uh, to use the second fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay, so now they're asking, on which of the following intervals is the graph concave down? So we want to find the second derivative. Well, let's go ahead and start doing the first derivative. Remember, the first derivative, according to this function, is literally just the function here evaluated at zero. This is the second fundamental theorem of calculus. So this is 2x cubed minus 15x squared plus 36x. All right, this is the first derivative. They want the second. So we're going to go ahead and take the second derivative of this, and that's 6x squared minus 30x plus 36. And we want to find when it's concave down. So first, let's go ahead and set it equal to zero. 6, let's factor out a 6 from this entire uh, expression here, and that becomes x squared minus 5x plus 6. Let's factor it out. And this becomes x minus 3, x minus 2. So we have two values. x is equal to 2 and 3. That's where our function is going to be um, equal to 0, or our second derivative. And now we just got to test values real quick. So let's plug in 0. Let's plug in uh, like 2.5. And then let's plug in 4. Remember, we don't care about what these values are. All we're going to do is plug it into this expression here. We just care about whether it's positive or negative. So when I plug in 0, I get 6 times 0 minus 3, so 6 times negative 3, times 0 minus 2, so that's negative 2. I don't care what this value is. I just know that I have a positive times a negative and a negative. This is a positive value times 6. This entire thing is going to be a positive value. Okay, so let's go ahead and put 2.5. Okay, so 2.5 is uh so we have six times 2.5 minus three that's just a negative value it's like negative 0 0.5 times 2.5 minus two that's positive 0.5 again i don't care what these values are i just have a negative or a positive times a negative times a positive this entire thing is negative and then last one uh if we plug in uh, a four so six times four minus three is one times four minus two is two that's all positive values so this entire thing is positive so if you notice, these are technically like points of uh, inflection. So we have two and three are points of inflection because they change concavity. But they're asking, when is it concave down? So the answer is from two to three only. All right. And guys, if you guys see something, uh, someone was talking about like, uh, I might have put like F double prime. If you see a mistake, please let me know in the comments, okay? It's always good to catch uh, if I made a mistake on these problems. All right. We're here to learn. All right. Let me zoom in on this one. So they want to know which of the following functions uh, has the limit as x approaches infinity of the function f of x is equal to 0. So let's try this one. Okay, if I were to take the limit of this, or if I were to plug in infinity, that's the idea, I would get infinity over infinity. So obviously I get an indeterminate form, so I can go ahead and take the derivative or use L'Hopital's rule, not necessarily the derivative. Let's go ahead and use L'Hopital's rule, the hospital rule. Okay, L'Hopital's. So now we have the limit as x approaches infinity of the derivative of the top, which is 1 over x, over the derivative of the bottom, which is 99 x to the 98. All right, if you were to simplify this, you would get 1 over 99 x to the 99, because this x basically went downward over here. Okay, and if you plug in infinity now, you get 1 over infinity, a big number on the bottom. I, like, I always like to think of this like you have one pizza, and it's divided amongst infinitely many people. How much pizza does each person get? Absolutely nothing. You guys get nada. So this limit's going to be zero. So we already know that one is going to be our answer or one of our answers. Okay, let's go ahead and try. Uh, Wesley, briefly explain the heart of the fundamental theory of calculus too. Uh, oh, the second fundamental theorem of calculus. I'll go over. I think there's going to be a problem in here. Um, and I'll go over that in a second. So here we go. Same thing. If I were to plug in infinity, I get infinity over infinity. 
So L'Hopital's rule, or at least we can try. Uh -huh. Okay, the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x over the derivative of 1 over x, or natural log of x, that's 1 over x. This is a little weird. If I plug in infinity, I get infinity over 1 over infinity. This is 0. Infinity over 0 does not equal 0. This is an indeterminate form. Okay? So, we need to do it again. Technically, when you get an indeterminate form, you have to do L'Hopital's rule again. If I do L'Hopital's rule again, check what happens. The derivative of e to the x is just e to the x. The derivative of 1 over x is negative 1 over x squared. Uh, we're still left with infinity over 0. Okay, try that out for yourself. So it doesn't work. So the idea is that if you continue doing this over and over again, you're still going to get the same shit, infinity over zero. So this is not going to be, or this limit is not going to approach zero. We can safely say that. Okay, so be gone. This next one's interesting. Okay, and it takes some uh, creativity and just kind of, uh, you know, thinking, uh, thinking in the future. So same thing if I were to plug in infinity, I get infinity over infinity. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and use L'Hopital's rule. So now we have the limit as x approaches infinity of 99x to the 98th power over e to the x. Oh, guess what? If you were to plug in infinity again, you're going to get infinity over infinity. Damn, you might think, okay, it looks like 1 is my only option. However, think about this. If we continue with L'Hopital's rule, if we take the derivative of e to the x, that is never just going to change. It's just e to the x, okay? It just never changes. That's just the way it is. We just have to deal with it. But 99 times x to the 98. Think about this. If I take the derivative, again, I get 99 times 98 x to the 97. Yeah, it's still infinity over infinity. But if I continue taking this derivative over and over and over again, this eventually, the x is eventually going to go away. In fact, this is going to be 99 factorial over e to the x. And 99 factorial, yes, it's a big number. But when you have e to the infinity, that's an even bigger number. So you have 0 because you have 99 factorial over infinity. That's still a big fat 0. So our answer is also going to be 3. So then we have option 1 and option 3. Okay, This is where a lot of we're going to start differentiating the people that get a 5 and the people that get a 4 because um, these questions are a little tricky sometimes. All right, let's continue. Number 13, whoops, here we go. And by the way, guys, I see some new people joining in. Don't forget that all replays are going to be on my YouTube. I am doing AP Calc Prep every single week. You could download this particular file that's on the link in my bio. And um, if you're watching this on YouTube as a replay, it is in, in the link in the description. Awesome. Okay, this particular question is actually really, really fun because, let's check this out. Ah. F of or let f be a differentiable function such that f of 0 is equal to negative 5, and we have the derivative is less than 3. Okay? Of the following, which is not a possible value for f of 2? What in the world are they even asking us here? Okay? Well, we know the original function, or a one term, f of 0, and we know that the derivative has to be less than or equal to 3. And then they want us to find something with f of 2. There's, we are given no function. Okay? that we are given no function whatsoever. So what we're going to use is MBT. Now remember, MBT tells you the function is differentiable, therefore it's continuous. Whoops, I moved too fast. And remember, MBT tells you that there is a derivative such that uh, that's equal to f of 0 minus f of 2 over 0 minus 2. OK? We know f of 0 that was given to us. That was negative 5. So we have negative 5 minus f of 2 over 0 minus 2 is negative 2. Okay. This here is equal to the derivative of some derivative. And we know that this expression then has to be less than or equal to 3 because that's what they told us up here. So we have negative 5 minus f of 2 over negative 2 is less than or equal to 3. Let's multiply the negative 2 to the other side. So we have negative 5 minus f of 2 is greater than or equal to negative 6 because I multiplied a negative to the other side so the inequality has to change. Let's add the 5 to the other side. Negative f of 2 has to be greater than or equal to negative 1. And then if f I divide the negative 1 to the other side, I get f of 2 is less than or equal to 1. So we know that f of 2, we don't know what the function is, but we just know that f of 2 has to be less than 1. Okay. Well, negative 10 
is less than one. So we know that could be a possible answer. Remember, they're saying which is not a possible option for f of two. Uh, negative five is less than one, so we can still use that one. Zero is less than one, yes. One is less than or equal to one, so the only option that we have is two. Okay, this is again where the fives and fours and the threes get are differentiated, or like this is where you know we really have to show up and the more we practice, the better, I promise you. And I'm gonna be here all month for you guys, okay? I'm gonna continue making lives and I'm gonna continue making uh, videos for you guys for you to enjoy. Okay, so here we go, number 14. Let f be a function above where all the, the values a and b for which f is differentiable at x is equal to one. Or they're asking what are all the values? I read that way too fast. Okay, well, first things first, if it's differentiable, that means that the function has to be continuous. So these two values have to be touching at one. So we know that x plus b has to equal to a of x squared, or a times x squared, when x is equal to 1. So let's go ahead and plug in 1. So 1 plus b is equal to a times 1 squared. If I simplify this, 1 plus b is equal to a. Okay, doesn't give us anything, but that's okay, because now they're talking about differentiability, so let's go ahead and take the derivative of both of the functions on the piecewise function here. So when I take the derivative of x plus b, I just get 1, and that should equal to the derivative of ax squared, and that's 2ax. And remember, these functions, in order for them to be differentiable, have to be the same or have to be equal to each other when x is equal to 1, because that's exactly what they're telling us up here. So if we have 1 is equal to 2a times 1, 1 is equal to 2a. If I divide the 2 to the other side, 1 half is equal to a. Awesome. Okay. So now we know 1 half is equal to a. Let's go ahead and plug it into the equation up here. So 1 plus b is equal to 1 half. Let's subtract the 1 to the other side. b is equal to negative 1 half. We have to be really, really uh, careful with our fractions there. So a is equal to 1 half, b is equal to negative 1 half. And it looks like the only option here is a. Beautiful. Let's continue, guys. Okay, we got uh, almost halfway there, I would say. But this isn't too bad. Okay. So they give us a table of functions for f and g and their derivatives at x is equal to 3. So they give us a, some random function k that's defined by this. And I'm already thinking, you're being divided here. They're probably going to ask me something about quotient rule. Okay. Uh, someone was asking. Ooh, okay. Someone was asking, why couldn't it be c? I just want to uh, talk about this one. A is equal to one half of B is any real number. You know what? Uh, you are absolutely right. Why couldn't it be C? That's true. Technically, A and C is true. But this is almost like the SAT and the ACT that you want to go with one that's even more true. So while C can be true, because that's what we found, that A was equal to one half. So C is technically an option, right? Because B is any real number. We can, But we shouldn't stop there because we went one step further and found that B was exactly equal to negative one half. Okay? So that's exactly why option A was going to be the best answer. Uh, that's a good, that's a really good question. I didn't even see C. I just went straight to find A and B. Okay. So don't, uh, even though C did look promising, make sure you finish it up because B was able to, we were able to find it. So B was equal to negative one half. So that's why A is the better answer. Okay. So back to this. So we want to find the value of k prime of 3. Oh, no surprise there because they gave us this quotient. They obviously want us to find the derivative. Okay, don't forget. Derivative is low d high minus high d low. I don't care how you memorize it. Memorize it however you want. So g of x times f prime of x minus f of x g prime of x over g of x squared. And now they want us to just plug in 3. So g of 3 times f prime of 3 minus f of 3 g prime of 3 over g of 3 squared. Okay, well, they obviously give us values here. So g of 3 is going to be 2, and f prime of 3 is going to be 5. So we have 2 times 5 minus f of 3 is going to be negative 1. g prime of 3 is going to be negative 2 over g of 3 squared. g of 3, where are we at? 2 squared. So I'm just going to put a 4 up here already. Okay, let's simplify this. 10, and then now we watch your negatives. This is a negative times negative 2, so this is positive 2, but then we have a negative here, so this is negative 2 over 4. So 8 over 4, so the answer is 2. C. 
All right. Ooh, here we go. Number 16, if y is equal to 5x root x squared minus uh, plus 1, then dy over dx at x is equal to 3 is what? dy over dx. Find the derivative. Okay, so dy over dx, we're going to use product rule. So we're going to use the first term. So that's just 5x times the derivative of this root. Now, if you haven't done this, don't forget that when you take the derivative of a root, okay, anything that has a square root, okay, so I, I did square root of u because u is just our inside value. This is equal to u prime over 2 root u. Keep that in mind. I think this knowing or knowing how to find the uh, derivative of the square root pretty quickly is extremely helpful. Okay, so now we have the derivative of root x squared. That's going to be the derivative of the inside, which is 2x over 2 root, and then just the stuff on the inside. Okay, plus now the derivative of 5x, which is 5, and then the second function. And now we just have to plug in 3. So 5 times 3 times, uh, let me go ahead here. I'm just going to cancel out the 2s. And so now we have 3 over root 3 squared plus 1 plus 5 root 3 squared plus 1. Okay, let's make this, or let's simplify this. 15 times 3. Remember, this is still a fraction multiplied by this 15. So 15 times 3 is 45 over root 10. Unfortunately, we can't simplify that. Plus 5 root 10. Ugh. Okay, well, none of our answers, actually, yes, they do. Our answers look like this. 45 root 10 plus 5 root 10. Oh, that is so nice. They bless us with that. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, AP graders. All right, guys, let's continue. Ooh, <laughs> I remember um, someone was doing this in class back in high school, and they were trying to take the limit of this. They were trying to break this apart. Like, girl, what are you doing? Actually, I don't know if it was a girl. It was a boy, but whatever. Boy, what are you doing? Anyway, if you notice this, this is arc sine of A plus H minus arc sine of A over H. Do you notice that this is literally the definition of the derivative at the point A? Okay, you got to recognize that because I guarantee they'll give you a problem like this. So what this is equal to is the derivative of arc sine at A. Okay, here, let me just sort of block this for now. I'll erase it in a second. So we got to find the derivative of arc sine. At a. So first, let's just go ahead and find the derivative of arc sine. Remember, this is 1 over root 1 minus x squared. You got to remember your derivatives of arc sine. And so when I plug in a, I get 1 over root 1 minus a squared. And that's supposed to equal to 2. All right, well, uh, let's go ahead and square everything. So we have 1 over 1 minus a squared is equal to 4. Okay, let's go ahead and bring this to the other side. So 1 over... 4 times 1 minus a squared. I want to make this easier on myself. So I will divide the 4. 1 fourth is equal to 1 minus a squared. If I subtract the 1, know your fractions, people. This is negative 3 fourths is equal to negative a squared. Okay, multiply both sides by negative 1. So we have 3 over 4 is equal to a squared. And I'll take the square root of both of these. So this is square root of 3 fourths plus or minus is equal to a. So the, technically, this is plus or minus root 3 over 2. Okay. So both of these are our answers. Either positive root 3 over 2 or negative root 3 over 2. And it looks like the only option is B. Okay. Does that make sense, guys? Let me clear this. All right. And don't forget, guys, I put all the replays on my YouTube channel. So if you have to leave for whatever reason, don't forget, I will put this up immediately once we're done. Okay. I feel like we got 10 more questions, 10 or 11 more questions. We got this. The next question, if natural log of 2x plus y is equal to x plus 1, then find the derivative. Explicit differentiation. Y'all knew it wasn't going to go away. Okay, so here we go. The derivative of natural log is 1 over 2x plus y times the derivative of what's inside. So the derivative of 2x is 2 plus. The derivative of y is technically 1, but then every time we include our implicit, or every time we take the derivative of y, we have to include the dy over dx. And then equals to the derivative of x plus 1, that's just going to be 1. Okay, um, let's go ahead and move the 2x plus y to the other side. I'm multiplying the 2x plus y to the other side, and I get 
2 plus dy dx is equal to 2x plus 1. At this point, I really don't even need the parentheses here. I'm just going to leave it like that, though. Okay, let's subtract the 2 to the other side. So my derivative, dy over dx, is 2x plus y minus 2. So 2x plus y minus 2, boom, our answer is b. Guys, the more of these we do, the better, okay? I have um, a Google Drive, but you can look in the link in my bio, and I have a drive there that you can click on, and I think I have like seven or seven or eight tests that you can do, okay? The more we practice, the better. This one looks fun. Oh, hold on, give me one second. I don't know if you can hear the, my music, but I just have to change it real quick. Yes, AP is easy. This is the multiple traits. It should totally be easy. Okay, so the figure above shows the graph of the function g and the line tangent to the graph at x is equal to negative 1. So this is my function g, and this is technically the derivative at negative 1. Okay? So let h be this function, e of x times, or e to the power of x times g of x. So find h prime of negative 1. Well, first, let's go ahead and find the derivative. So we're going to use product rule. So we're going to use the first term, e to the x, times g prime of x, plus the derivative of e to the x, so just e to the x, times g of x. Okay? And now we're going to go ahead and plug in negative 1. So we have e to the negative 1, g prime of negative 1, plus e to the negative 1, g of negative 1. A few things that I'm going to do, just because I see this e to the negative 1, I'm just going to pull it out, just to make my life a little easier. You don't have to do this, but I just wanted to especially because we got plenty of time. Okay, we're going to find g prime of negative 1. In a, actually, let's just do that now. g prime of negative 1. Remember, this is the derivative, the slope of the tangent line at negative 1. So how do we find the slope of the tangent line? Well, luckily for us, we've been blessed with the actual e slope here or the actual graph. And look, they gave us two points here. So we can find the slope. You'll notice that this is goes down 6 and over 1. So g prime of negative 1 is equal to negative 6. And so now we have e to the negative 1 of negative 6 plus g of negative 1 is just the y value when x is equal to negative 1. That's the coordinate here. So that's 3. And now we simplify this. This is e to the negative 1 times uh, negative 3. But none of these look at our answers. The only thing that we have to do is because this is a negative exponent, this is going to become negative 3 over e. And so that's our answer, or e to the power of 1. I just didn't write that. So there's my answer, b. All right. Number 20. Ooh, I hope this person, I don't know who was on here, but they wanted to talk about the fundamental theorem of calculus, or the second fundamental theorem of calculus. So this example here, they want us to find the derivative of this particular function, okay? which is, happens to be an integral. So we're going to use the second fundamental theorem of calculus. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you what the, the or how we find the second fundamental theorem of calculus or how we use it. Okay, so the idea right now, we're just going to put the idea real quick, is that if we were to take the derivative of some function from A to let's just do some, uh, some random function G of X. We don't know what this is. Okay, and then we have F of T DT. Okay. So first, we're just going to worry about the integral. According to the first fundamental theorem of calculus, this right here is equal to capital F of G of X minus capital F of A, where F is the antiderivative, G of X was just plugged in, and then A was just the constant. So now when we take the derivative of this, we're going to take the derivative of F, or capital F, which just becomes lowercase f of G of X, times g prime of x, because we just applied the chain rule here, minus the derivative of this is a constant, so this is just 0. So this just goes away. I'm not even going to write that. That's the second fundamental theorem of calculus. We have to be very careful with that, especially in this case, because we have a 2x on here. Okay? So they're basically what they're saying is that if you want to take the derivative of an integral, it's just equal to the original function evaluated at one of the parameters here, times the derivative of that uh, specific parameter. So this answer here, okay, before I even take the derivative, or actually I'm just going to take the derivative now, or I'm going to solve it. This is equal to natural log of, and then we have to insert the 2x in for the value of t here, 
So this is 2x cubed plus 1 times the derivative of this particular function that was our parameter. So this becomes times 2 because the derivative of 2x is equal to 2. And so if we simplify this, I'll put the 2 on the outside. So 2 natural log of, we can simplify this. This becomes 8x cubed plus 1. And guys, our answer is whoop, right there, D. Got to be careful with this because I know it's going to show up not only on the multiple choice, but definitely on the FRQ. All right, so be prepared. Okay, number 21. The graph of the function f is shown above. What is the integral from 0 to 7 of f of x? Okay, so f of x is this particular function. Don't forget, we're not even given the function. So a lot of people are going to say, well, what the fuck am I supposed to do? Because uh, I don't know what the function of f is. Miguel, what do I do? Do not forget that the integral from 0 to 7 represents the area underneath the curve. So what you got to do is you got to find the area of this shape and then the area of this shape because they want it from 0 to 7. And don't forget that this area is going to be negative because it's below the x-axis. Okay, so there's a couple shapes here. And again, this is, not some, this is something that you should definitely know. All right, I'm going to break this apart into a couple shapes. I'm going to do three shapes here, and then I have a triangle down here. Now, the reason why I'm doing this is because um, I want to find the area of this trapezoid here. Some people, if they don't memorize or if they don't remember the area of a trapezoid, you can definitely cut this up into basically a triangle up here and then a rectangle here. There's no issue with that. But I'm just going to do a trapezoid, okay? So remember, the area of a trapezoid is 1 half base 1 plus base 2. In this case, you just have to realize the bases are technically the heights. So base 1, 1 plus 2 times our height. And the height is technically the distance here. So this is going to be 2. It's a little different to uh, or difficult to kind of wrap our minds around. But if you want to break it apart into the triangle and the rectangle thing that I mentioned, you're more than welcome to. Okay, so this becomes 3. This is an area of 3. Up here, we have a rectangle with a base of 2 and then a height of 2, so 4. Here we have a triangle. So remember, triangle is 1 half base, which is 1, times height, which is 2. So the area, if you do this quickly, that's just going to be 1. And then down here, area is 1 half base, which is 2, times height. It's downward, so it's negative 2. Okay, so this area is going to be uh, negative 2. Be very careful with that, okay? It's underneath, um, it's underneath the, um, it's underneath uh, the x-axis. Oh, buddy. Oh, buddy, you're late to the party. Okay, so 3 plus 4 is 7, plus 1 is 8, minus 2, the answer is going to be 6. And look, if you didn't make this a negative, this would have been 3 plus 4 is 7, plus 1 is 8, plus 2 is 10. That's still an option, and you would have gotten that incorrect. So be very careful with that. All right, guys, we got seven more problems. We got this. Okay, number 22. So we have the function f that's continuous for all real numbers, and the average rate of change of f on the closed interval whoops, from 6 to 9 is negative 3 halves. Okay? I'm just going to write the average rate of change. So don't forget, the average rate of change is just like a y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So really, this is f of 9 minus f of 6 over 9 minus 6. If I simplify this, minus f of 6 is equal to 3. And they're saying that this is equal to negative 3 halves. Okay, I'll actually put it on this side. It's equal to negative 3 halves. Okay? For what reason am I writing this? I don't know. I'm just doing it just because that's some information they gave me. But there's telling us that there is no value of c such that the derivative is equal to negative 3 halves. This sounds oddly familiar. There is no value of c such that the derivative is equal to negative 3 halves, f prime of c. That is very much like the mean value theorem. Y'all remember the mean value theorem? MVT tells you that if the function is continuous and if it's differentiable, okay, then f prime of c is equal to, or there is a c value such that f prime of c is equal to the rate of change. Okay? Well, let's see. They told us it's continuous, so we know that for sure. They told us that there, this is equal to negative 3 halves, but there's telling us that 
f prime of c is not equal to that. There's no value for that. So which of the following must be true? This just tells you that the average value is equal to negative 3 halves. I mean, I don't know. The integral does not exist. How in the world are we supposed to know that if they just told us about the function? Again, I, I'm not sure. f prime of 6 minus plus f prime of 9 over 2 is equal to negative 3 halves. Uh, what is that? And then D, the derivative is less than zero for all x values on the open interval x uh, 6 to 9. I mean, we only know that it's negative 3 halves from 6 to 9, but we don't know if it's always that the case. But look at this. F is not differentiable. So they told us here that F, there's no C that equals negative 3 halves, meaning that the MBT does not work. So they told us it's continuous already, so that must mean that this is not true because otherwise the MBT would work and there will be a C such that the derivative is equal to negative three halves. This one, utterly, utterly confusing. It is ugly. We thank the, the, the AP calc people for all the other problems, but this one, we'll give them a big. Someone's asking, where can you find this? I have a link in my bio, okay, that you can go and you could download this one specifically. And then right after this, I'm gonna post a replay and I'm going to post a link to a Google Drive where you can find a bunch of other uh, multiple choice questions that I have. And just keep in mind real quick, okay, before we, we continue, Tuesdays or today I'm doing a multiple choice, Thursday I'm doing the calculator portion, and then Friday I'm doing the free response questions that all are going to be on my YouTube channel, okay? And then next, next week, uh, test. I'm going to be here all month long, guys. This is going to be, uh, we're going to have a good time. Okay, so here we go, 23. We have the function 2x plus e to the x, and they're telling us that g of x is equal to the inverse. And we want to find the point, uh, and we all know that the point 0, 1 is on the graph. Okay, So we want to find g prime. Now, they already established this is the inverse function, so we got to remember how to find the derivative of the inverse function. And that's 1 over f prime of g of x. Okay, we gotta remember how to find the derivative of an inverse function. Someone's doing, or someone's saying do calc bc, that'll be next week. I promise, we're doing calc bc too, okay? But watch out for any videos that I've continued to post. It's all gonna be a, b, and bc. We'll have some fun this month. All right, well, they want us to find g prime of one. So if I were to plug in this value, I get one over f prime of g of one. Well, we gotta find g of one. Okay, remember, g of 1, g is the inverse of the function, okay? So if g of 1, or if we're trying to find g of 1, then really what we're trying to find is the function of f or the value of x that makes our function f equal to 1, okay? Think about that. This one's extremely uh, annoying and can be confusing. We're trying to find g of 1, which is the inverse. So this is the input for the inverse. In other words, it's the output for the original function, okay? Whoa, 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 they already told us that point. They told us that when x is equal to zero, y is equal to one. So shoot, this is just f of zero. Okay, well, again, this is the input, that's the output. So for the inverse, if one is the input, then zero is the output. So g of one is equal to zero. So what we're trying to find is one over f prime of zero, because that's what we were trying to find. So now all we have to do is find the derivative of f. The derivative of f, I'll put it here on the, the left side, is 2x plus e to the x. f prime of x is equal to 2 plus e to the x. If I plug in 0, f prime of 0 is equal to 2 plus e to the 0. Don't forget, e to the 0 is 1. 1 plus 2, that's just 3. So now we have our answer, 1 over 3. Booyah. They're trying to make this difficult on us? Hell no. Hell no. No, 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 we're not gonna let that happen, okay? We're not gonna let them fool us. This is the multiple choices where you can get all your free points, and then the FRQ is where we suffer and where we cry, but not here. All right, guys, a few more problems to go. So we have the function g of x, and what is the absolute minimum of the function on the closed interval? So remember, if you wanna find the absolute minimum, absolute maximum, yes, we need to plug in the the endpoints, which in this case are negative two and one. Maybe I can zoom in on here just a tiny bit, okay? No, 
okay? So we can we need to plug in negative two and we need to plug in one because those that's a possibility, those are the minimums. But first what we need to do is we need to find whether or not there's other relative minimums or relative extremas in the function. So let's go ahead and take the derivative. G prime of x is equal to 12x squared plus 6x minus six. Oh, we got this. Okay, if we set this equal to zero, because that's what the extremas are going to occur, we're going to factor out a 6 and get 2x squared plus 1x minus 1. Oh, okay. I'm not even going to try to guess this one. I actually like to factor this uh, a different way. So I'm multiplying, I'm doing the, the slip and slide. So what values multiply to negative 2, add to 1, and that's going to be 2 and negative 1. And then I divide my 2s. Okay, so this becomes 6 times x plus 1, and then 2x minus 1. A lot of people already know how to just write this out. I don't do that. I don't trust myself. So we have x is equal to negative 1, and then 1 half. Okay, these are the extremas. Okay, we can go ahead and find out which ones are minimums, which ones are maximums. There's absolutely no problem in that. But how about we just find out, whoops, how about we just go back up here and find out what g of negative 1 is, and then what g of uh, 1 half is. Okay. Yo, I don't want to I don't want to do this all this work. Okay? Well, if I plug in -2 into this function, let me just erase this. Maybe I can move this a little bit in case you guys are trying to see how I got that work. Okay, so if I plug in -2, that's 4 times -2q 3 times -2 Minus 6 times negative 2 plus 1. Oh my goodness. Okay. So 4 times negative 2 cubed, that's negative 8 times 4. That's negative 32. Uh, did I, oh, I forgot the squared up here. This is, this is horrible. 3 times negative 2 squared. So this becomes a 4. So plus 2 or uh, times 4. That's a plus 12. And then this is another negative 6 times negative 2. That's a plus 12. And that's a plus 1. Oh my goodness. So negative 32 plus 24, that's negative 8 plus 1. So now we have negative 7. Okay, not bad. So let's plug in the 1. 1 is really easy because this everything just becomes uh, nice. So this is 4 times 1 cubed plus 3 1 squared minus 6 times 1 plus 1. So 4 plus 3 minus 6 plus 1. 4 plus 3 is 7, minus 6 is 1 plus 1, that's going to be 2, okay? So, so far we can eliminate g of 1 because negative 7 is so much lower than that, okay? So now let's go ahead and plug in negative 1. 4, negative 1 cubed, plus 3, negative 1 squared, minus 6, negative 1, plus 1. Okay, 4 times negative 1 cubed. Negative 1 cubed is negative 1 times 4, that's negative 4. 3 times negative 1 squared. Negative 1 squared is just 1, so that's just plus 3. And then negative 6 times negative 1, that's plus 6, uh, plus 1. Oh my goodness, negative 4 plus 3, that's going to be negative 1 plus 6. That's going to be 5 plus 1, that's 6. Hope I got that right. Uh, yes. Okay, so still, it looks like negative 7 still beats it, so we can eliminate that. Last one, y'all. 4 times 1 half cubed plus 3 times 1 half squared minus 6 times 1 half plus 1. Okay. Well, 1 half cubed is 1 eighth times 4. That's 1 half. Uh, 1 half squared is 1 fourth times 3. That's 3 fourths. It's not terrible. And then uh, minus 6 times 1 half is minus 3 and then plus 1. I have a feeling, you can trust me, that this is definitely not less than negative 7. So I think we're done. Gosh, that's a multiple choice test. That's an, so annoying. So annoying. All right, but we're almost done. Ah, actually, guys, it looks... Wait, 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 wait. Give me one second. Can y'all see me? Oh, my God. The live was about to end, and I had to, like, verify it was me or something. They're trying to make sure that I'm not a bot. Okay. Let's continue. So, 25, which of the following is the solution to this particular differential equation? Oh, gosh, I'm pretty sure at this point everyone's gassed. But that's okay. So before we continue, let's go ahead and separate this into e to the y times e to the x. Okay, so I could bring the e to the y to the other side. And I could bring the d to the x to the other side. So we're using separation of variables here. And this is where we can go ahead and take the integral. At this point, they're betting on you to sort of know how to find these integrals pretty quickly. Because this is negative e to the negative y is equal to e to the x and then plus c. We'll add the c only to this side. Okay, so now let's go ahead and use the initial condition. 
that when x is equal to zero, y is equal to negative natural log of four. So we have negative e to the negative natural log of four is equal to e to the zero plus c. This right here, whoops, uh, let me just double change this a little bit. I totally did this wrong. This is negative e to the negative negative natural log of four. So this just becomes negative e to the natural log of four is equal to one plus c. You'll notice that this just cancels out. This is just negative four now is equal to one plus c. Let's bring the one to the other side. Negative five is equal to c. Ooh, we. Okay. So now we have our function. Negative e to the negative y is equal to e to the x minus five. Let's go ahead and multiply both sides by negative one. So we have negative e to the x plus five. Final few steps. Take the natural log of both sides so that we have negative y is equal to natural log of negative e to the x plus five. And let's go ahead and just multiply everything by a negative one. So this, my friends, is the function that they're looking for. Negative natural log of negative e to the x plus five. So it is gonna be C. Oh shoot, and I could have seen that. Guys, we could have seen that that was a five. So we could have said, okay, that's my answer. Oh gosh, all right. All right, again, betting on for you guys to sort of mess this up, okay? So they give us, they wanna know which is the antiderivative of this function, okay? This is a non-elementary function. This, the antiderivative really does not exist. However, um, they want to, um, they definitely want to try to confuse you now, which is the antiderivative, meaning that if this is my function, they're saying that if I were to take the derivative of this function, I should get this. And that clearly won't work. I'll just give you a quick example. If I use power rule, then I'll have the three halves multiplied over here. So yes, it, it goes away, but we have one times one plus X cubed. But then when you subtract by one, you get negative one half. And that's not the same as this because the negative one half will be on the bottom. Okay, you can try to take the derivative of this. Uh, I don't feel like doing that. So we're just gonna say, ah, I don't think that's gonna be it for now. Okay, I'm not gonna cross it off. We can cross off A. If we take the derivative of this, okay, this is technically one plus X cubed, that's true. But remember, second fundamental theorem of calculus tells us that we gotta take the derivative of the parameter we added. So this is just three X squared. So this is not it. And when we come here, if we take the derivative, we get root one plus x cubed, looks promising, but again, we gotta take the derivative of the value that we just included. So that's three x squared. Nope, that's not it. So the only option is gonna be this one, and I'll show you that it's true, because when you plug it in, or when you take the derivative, you get one plus x cubed times, the derivative of x is just one. This is our function. So the answer is E. Okay, this is where five, uh, a grade of a five are made, man. Oh, gosh, almost there, guys. I think we got two more problems, and then we're going to be done. It's been an honor being on here with you guys. Okay, so let's go ahead and continue. So we have the height of an object is suspended by the given function. What is the average height of this function from 0 to 2? Now, remember, average value or average height in this case, because they're talking about the height in general, is 1 over b minus a integral from a to b of the function. So in this case, we're taking the integral from zero to two. So our a is zero, our b is two. So when we take our integral, we get one over two minus zero, integral from zero to two of this function that was given to us. 16 plus seven cosine of seven pi over four t dt. Okay, so the one half's on the outside here. If I take the integral of 16, I just get 16 t plus seven sine seven pi, whoops, what was, there was no seven pi. This is just pi over four, pi over four t. Okay, so this is sine pi over four t, whoops. And then times four over pi, we have to account for that. This is where they're betting on you to take the integral pretty quickly. And don't forget this is evaluated from zero to two. So now we have one half, when you plug in the two into everything, we get 32, because 16 times two, plus seven sine of, when you plug in two into this function, pi over four times two, it's just pi over two times four pi, times four over pi, minus 
when you plug in zero into the 16t, that just becomes zero, so minus zero. And then when you plug in zero into this sine, so pi over four times zero is zero, so sine of, of zero is just zero. So luckily for us, we don't have to worry about that. So now our answer is just gonna be this right here. We just sort of have to simplify. So we have one half times 32, plus if I simplify this, this is 28 over pi, so, and then sine of pi is just one, so I'm not even worried about that. And then when I distribute the one half to both terms, I get 16 plus 14 over pi. Whew. Our answer is D. How nice. Okay, so very quickly, before I take before we leave, because this is my this was the final question. The question why is why did I change this to four over pi? So one of the things that you could see or to verify is take the derivative of this and you'll see that we need the four pi there. But if you really must know, I'll just kind of do a row over here. I'm trying to take the integral of pi over four t dt. Okay, if we use u substitution, which is basically what I did, I just did it very quickly because this is a multiple choice test. We're sort of supposed to be pretty uh, versed with that. Our u value is pi over 4t, du is equal to pi over 4 dt. So if I bring this to the other side, I get 4 over pi du is equal to dt. And so I'll have an integral over here of integral of cosine of u times 4 over pi du. Okay, if I just bring the 4 over pi on the outside, I really just have cosine of u du. The integral of cosine of u is just pi, or pi, it's sine of u plus c. But remember, our u value was this up here. So that is why I had a 4 over pi there. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay. Last problem, guys. So now we have the function, number 28. We have the function f of x is equal to sine of x plus cosine of x. From 0 to 2 pi, what is the x-coordinate of the point of inflection? But be careful where the graph changes from concave down to concave up. Okay, point of inflection means I have to find the second derivative. So the first derivative is just uh, the derivative of sine, which is going to be cosine x plus the derivative of cosine, which is minus sine x. Second derivative is negative sine x minus cosine x. And first thing I want to do is I want to find out when this is equal to zero. So I get sine of x is equal to negative cosine of x. All I did was bring the sine to the other side. So we want to look in the unit circle. If you don't know your unit circle, I'm telling you, it's coming to haunt you. You got to know that. Okay, where did I get this paper? Look at the link in my bio. You can download it. Okay, every week I'm going to have the specific paper I'm covering that you can just download. Okay. So where is sine equal to negative cosine? Think of the unit circle. I'm really looking where sine and cosine are the same but opposite signs. And that happens here at three pi over four. And that happens in quadrant four at seven pi over four. So three pi over four and seven pi over four are my potential point of inflections. We just gotta test points. Now, it's only between zero and two pi, so I'm not too worried about that, remember. Pick some points to the left of 3 pi over 4, how about pi over 2? And then in between 3 pi over 4 and 7 pi over 4, how about pi? And then the last one, like 11 pi over 6. Okay. So when I plug this in, or when I plug this in, my accent just came out there. Uh, I'm going to plug it into my second derivative, and I just want to know if it's a concave up or concave down. So what happens when I plug in pi over 2? So I have negative 7 pi over 2 minus cosine of pi over 2. Know your unit circle, it's gonna bite you in the ass. Negative seven pi over two is just, negative uh, seven pi over two, it doesn't make sense. Negative sine of pi over two is gonna be uh, negative one because sine of pi over two is one, but with the negative, it's just negative one. Cosine of pi over two is zero, so our answer here is negative, looking good. And then cosine of pi, negative sine of pi minus cosine of pi. Sine of pi is zero, so that goes away. Sine, cosine of pi is negative one, but with the negative out here, it becomes a positive. And then last one, 11 pi over six. Negative sine of 11 pi over six minus cosine of 11 pi over six. Now remember, sine, sine of 11 pi over six is negative one half. So with the negative on the outside, this is one half minus cosine of 11 pi over six is just root, root three over two. This right here is a negative value, okay? You got to sort of think about that. Root 3 is a little bit bigger than 1, so this whole thing will be negative. 
They were asking, when is it changing from concave down to concave up? It looks like it's changing right here at 3 pi over 4. And that is our answer, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. I did these questions. I believe if I scroll back up, uh, how many... I explained it pretty well, in my opinion, and you were supposed to have 55 minutes. I think I, I went over an hour, but of course, I stopped to kind of explain things. Now, don't forget, on Thursday, I am going to go live actually on Instagram, so I'm sort of just changing it around. And on Thursday, in two days, we're going to do this section. This is going to be the calculator portion, so I'll have my calculator with me, and I'll sort of just explain things as to how I solved it. And I'll kind of show you. But if you don't follow me on Instagram, that's okay. Do that if you can. Uh, and I'm going to post all the replays on my YouTube channel. And then every Friday, I'm going to post the six multi uh, FRQs for this exam. Okay. If I scroll down, these are the FRQs. Just so you know, these are the ones that I would do. And then next week, we're going to do BC. We're going to have some fun with that. So if you nerds or if you guys are the cycles that are taking BC exams, uh, tune in next week or tune in for this as well because the AB is also part of your exam. Um, so yeah, guys, follow me on TikTok, follow me on Instagram, follow me on YouTube. I'll be here all month to help you nerds prepare for the AP exam. Why? Because that's what we do. Okay. All right, guys. And I think that is all I have for today. Whoa, 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 whoa. I don't want to dox myself there. But anyway, um, I'm going to take off. That's all I have for today. I'm going to see you guys on Thursday on my Instagram. And then I'll see you guys on Friday on my YouTube channel. Just come hang out. Okay. Do you do series for FRQs for BC? I believe there's always going to be a McLaurin series. Okay. And uh, they always... Um, they always love to trick you with that. Okay. Why don't I do abstract complex analysis linear algebra? I, you know, I do, but every time I do that, literally no one cares. Okay. So I think the majority of people just like to have uh, calculus stuff. But look on my Instagram. I always try to post like some complex analysis stuff. But this month, unfortunately, I'm literally just going to be focusing on the AP calculus. And after that, maybe we can have some fun with uh, the complex analysis stuff. Okay. All right, y'all. Take it easy. It was fun. I'll see you guys on Thursday. I'll see you guys on Friday. I'll see you guys the rest of the month. So excited. Peace.